look at this cute little guy. Wait, 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 pause. What do they use? Reinforcement learning? How long should it swing that leg? How long should it hold the leg in contact? Where in the world should the robot step? It's really hard to come up with a good solution. Now with reinforcement learning, as long as we're able to simulate these hard problems, there's a class of problems that we should be able to tackle. Reinforcement they actually use it, wow. Reinforcement learning is the hardest field of machine learning that is about interacting with an environment and beating the game, meaning accomplishing some task. And coincidentally enough, this is the field that I currently study, so I know some things. This Venn diagram shows you how beautiful it is, combining so many different fields together. Computer science, neuroscience, psychology, economics, mathematics, engineering, and a bunch of other fields like sociology or evolutionary biology and other stuff. I just really like this diagram. I mean, in general, I just love Venn diagrams. <laughs> I really do. I love Venn diagrams. <laughs> I really do. It's just something about those three circles and the analysis about where there is the intersection, right? But okay, so I got us intrigued. Reinforcement learning sounds really cool. So how do we begin? What are the best resources for learning reinforcement learning? Give yourself a treat every time you learn something new about reinforcement learning. RL is indeed very hard. I will keep repeating it throughout this video. And I will not teach you today how to begin, how to start, how to learn. I will show you rather why would you even study it or not. If it's so hard, why did I pick it? Why did I choose to study it instead of something less risky and more sensible? And that's a good question. Okay, it's not that bad, it's just really hard. As a real man, I like when it's hard, I like a challenge, you know, if it was easy, everyone would do it. But it's not only challenging, it's also risky and uncertain. Anjun made a talk about the future of AI in the next few years and how much different fields will grow in terms of market value. Reinforcement learning is tiny and will remain tiny compared to other machine learning fields. There's a good reason for it and it's that reinforcement learning sucks and it's unreliable and expensive and tragic and disastrous and it's a hell to go to, it's impossible to debug. Want me to keep going? RL has incredible potential. RL will one day grow up to be something, but today RL does not work. It's probably going to be some like fancy hyperparameter tune thing that kind of works. Like GANs work, but your GAN doesn't work. Right? Like style GAN works and Dreamer V3 work, but your GAN and your RL don't work. I mean, I like this guy too much, but how funny is that? GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, they work. It's just not your GANs, not my GANs. RL, yeah, it works. Just not your RL, not my RL. We can say that it works sometimes, but when it works, it gets beautiful. The video from Sedbling from 2015 is especially close to my heart because it's the first thing I saw as a kid from reinforcement learning before I knew what programming is. I was like, damn, that's so cool. How do I make this? How do I learn how to do this? Then we got Alpha Zero and their achievements. I was like, 
Damn, that's so cool. How do I, how do I become a part of this? Then I saw reinforcement learning in robotics. I was like, nah, man, how do I become a part of this? I want to do this. <laughs> Someone get me there. Then we got Mew Zero, Deep Nash, Dreamer V3. But don't get fooled by survivorship bias. Of course, we see these compelling successes because if a project fails, there's nothing to show. What we see is not representative of the field. I mean, they can still write papers, but it would sound like every student's report ever. In conclusion, we did not succeed, but we learned a lot. It's like, I mean, good for you, but nobody's gonna read this. And the few successes that we have are not trivial. To make something as impressive as the famous AlphaGo, you don't just let it run and hope for the best. There's a whole process, like a carefully crafted work of art. Every thousand training iterations, they were benchmarking their model on 400 games to see if it's better than their previous best model. If it wasn't, they constantly discard it and they tweak things, they try stuff, they save from checkpoints, constantly, constantly, constantly until they got something. It's like a literal work of art. It starts to resemble a piece of art, like a painting, not AI generated, just like, please give me a beautiful landscape, boom, done. It's like Leonardo da Vinci's painting, stroke by stroke, with slightly translucent paint that you can stack on itself and you get subsurface scattering and all this stuff. Me, as an enthusiast, I'm disappointed that they discontinue most of these projects, but for them it makes a lot of sense, it's just not profitable. Reinforcement learning is just really hard and it's hard to put it to use. That's why I feel like the field needs more talent. My talent especially. I picked it as an exciting thing to work on and will get this thing rolling, hopefully. Sometimes I give it my all with no attachment to the result. So I'm committed to it. And that's what I like, commitment, long-term games. But I'm committed to what exactly and why is it hard? I gave you an overview, but now we're getting into details. Many of you might not even be sure what's reinforcement learning, so let's back up for a second. Forget even machine learning. Reinforcement learning is a study of what to do, how to act, meaning how to map situations to actions. That's how it started, as a very broad problem. You can search up like dynamic programming. These were the origins of reinforcement learning back in the 1950s. I happen to know this. And I read a whole book about fundamentals, fundamentals of reinforcement learning, and nearly half of the book is spent on tabular methods, meaning in table, for simple environments. If you can reasonably list all the possible states an agent can be in, then you can mathematically solve this environment. We can guarantee improvement of the policy. We know how to do it. I mean, I hope you know what I mean. If we have this table, so every state is evaluated and we happen to be in this state, we know that we shouldn't go left or right, we should go up, because this is the highest valued state. I mean, the highest valued next state from this one. Then we go up again, up again, up again, left. And this puts us in this new state. So we go here and we go up again, up again. So thanks to this table, we know what to do at every step. But for more practical environments, for more complex environments, you cannot just reasonably do this. I mean, first of all, you'd need a ton and ton of memory to list all the states. But for complex environments, you don't even get to be in all the state. You don't get to just brute force every single state and calculate optimal behavior. Like, look at life. I get to be in this state, in this room at this moment, but like, Think of all the possible states a human can be in. Not only like physical places, but like emotional states, mental states, all this stuff, like this is incredible. The number of states I get to be in and explore is like tiny, 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 tiny fraction. It's unimaginably tiny. And somehow I'm still here doing, like we cannot guarantee that this is optimal behavior, of course, but like, I'm doing something, I have some success, I roughly know what to do despite exploring so few steps. That's where machine learning comes in, where we use neural networks to find patterns in our states and approximate optimal behavior. But unfortunately, we lose all the beautiful properties we had earlier. 
we no longer, like as we start estimating, we no longer guarantee improvement of the policy. The performance might deteriorate. We might forget things. We might enter some local optimum and like never escape it. This is from the book I mentioned earlier. The root cause of the difficulties with the discounted control setting is that with function approximation, we have lost the policy improvement theorem. It is no longer true that if we change the policy to improve the discounted value of one state, then we are guaranteed to have improved the overall policy in any useful sense. That guarantee was the key to the theory of our reinforcement learning control methods. With function approximation, we have lost it. Neural networks allow us to even approach these complex environments, but they also give us all the hardships, all the struggle, all the, all the uncertainty and instability. Also, with the introduction of neural networks, we go from reinforcement learning to deep reinforcement learning that we shorten to reinforcement learning. <laughs> don't ask me, I don't make the rules. Not yet. But that also makes reinforcement learning a part of machine learning now. And knowing this, let's go back to the slide from Anjun talking about the future of machine learning so we can understand the differences. Supervised machine learning is all about labels, labeling things. You know what you want from the model, you compare it to what it gives you currently, and you steer it, nudge it into the correct direction. So whatever neural network outputs, you know exactly if it's correct or wrong, and how correct or how wrong. So this has obvious uh, tons of use cases in object detection, classification, in medicine. You can just show the network a bunch of cancer tissues on a photo, then you can train it, train it, train it, train it, and you can detect cancer tissues. Then we get unsupervised learning, and it's all about pattern recognition, where there is no ground truth, just like patterns of data to be associated together. It's used a lot in anomaly detection, where you can control a production process, and you can have an automatic like warning signal if something goes terribly wrong, or like something doesn't quite match up the, the rest of the distribution. Uh, it's also used in natural language processing. So it's like you don't know exactly what the model should output every single time, but it outputs something and you can like rate it, judge it. You can be like, okay, I guess, I guess that works. That sounds okay. Generative AI is the new growing field that we all know and love, maybe. And that's all about creating content, either that's text, audio, images, videos, all this stuff. I mean, it is like tightly connected to unsupervised learning. I mean, these terms are blurry. They are whatever we make them. So this is a part of unsupervised learning, but we distinguish it just for the sake of distinguishing. So why are all these methods doing so much better than reinforcement learning? I mean, in terms of market value and use cases. I told you already, because reinforcement learning is hard. But why is it hard? When you know the definition already, just think about what differs reinforcement learning from all these methods and the main thing i mean the first thing that skyrockets the complexity is time dependence and is that the action you take right now influences all of your future and the present is influenced by all your past the rewards can be delayed you can take a wrong turn and realize it only like many steps into the future so if you took a wrong turn Everything might seem fine at the beginning, you might be happy, but then suddenly it leads you to being at a dead end, stuck, hopeless, because of this turn you made a few years back. Does that sound familiar? This complexity itself, that every action comes in this huge context of your past and the future, like increases the complexity by orders of magnitude. And this starts to sound more like actual real life like i'm sitting in this room right now recording this video when will i know that this was the correct move after i publish it after i invest so much energy and i don't know you'll tell me that this video sucks and i'm just like dude i don't know i try my best what, what, what do you want me to do and there are other videos after like you know three years of publishing them randomly after three years someone writes me a comment Wow, this is so inspiring. Thank you, thank you. I'm just like, dude, now I get a positive feedback. Now I get a reward. <laughs> you know, like, I cannot be certain. This uncertainty is incredible. This is what makes life unique. This is what makes reinforcement learning 
unique and hard. Reinforcement learning is also the only method that involves trial and error. Nobody will tell you what to do and it, like you don't know exactly yourself what's, what's the correct move or what's the signal or how much you should listen to the immediate reward or what's even going on. You might try stuff, see if they work. You have to invent your own experiments. You have to just try stuff. If it works, maybe that's that's a correct move. And then it stops working. And what do you do? You have to adjust. Like, wait, that was working. You have to constantly try, experiment, test things out, test hypotheses. Like, this is hard, man. <laughs> maybe I need some synonyms for hard. This is problematic. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Reinforcement learning is problematic. Now think again about supervised learning, how easy it is compared to this. It's like if you took a turn and knew exactly if it's a wrong turn, just like boom, no, try again until you make a right turn. Supervised learning is like a tool you can deploy to use to detect what you want. Reinforcement learning is just like, I don't know, man. We're trying to balance long-term investments that might be unpleasant in the moment, but we know that might be promising in the future. <laughs> like, I don't know. And this is what I want to do in life. This is what I can contribute to society. And me picking reinforcement learning is one of my decisions, one of my actions. So it's like, if that was a correct move, if I picked my career correctly, then I'm pretty good at reinforcement learning because I can make good decisions and know how to make them. But if I didn't, then I would be terrible anyway, so... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of fun. I don't care about money that much. I mean, if I want money, I'll have to figure out how to put reinforcement learning to use. It's all up to me. Such a powerful mindset. It's all up to me. Who will fix reinforcement learning and put it to use if not me? Nobody. Okay, so we know that reinforcement learning is hard and problematic, but we have some algorithms, right? We have some guidelines, some steps, tutorials. We know roughly like how to begin at least, like how to do something. So how does this experience look like? There's a fantastic blog post from Alexander Irban. Deep reinforcement learning doesn't work yet. Look, here's a simple pendulum task. Like you cannot get simpler than this. Here's a plot of performance. Seven of these runs worked, three of these runs didn't. A 30% failure rate counts as working. Here's another plot. The environment is half chira. The dark line is the median performance over 10 random seeds and the shader region is the 25th to 75th percentile. Don't get me wrong, this plot is a good argument in favor of VIME. That's some exploration method of theirs. But on the other hand, the 25th percentile line is really close to zero reward. That means about 25% of runs are failing just because of random seed. Look, there is variance in supervised learning too, but it's rarely this bad. If my supervised learning code failed to be random chance 30% of the time, I'd have super high confidence there was a bug in data loading or training. If my reinforcement learning code was no better than random, I have no idea if it's a bug, if my hyperparameters are bad, or if I simply got unlucky. That being said, the next time someone asks me whether reinforcement learning can solve their problem, I'm still going to tell them that no, it can't. But I'll also tell them to ask me again in a few years. By then, maybe it can. I mean, the post is from 2018. It's 2024 and the blog post is pretty much spot on, so yeah. And that's how it is. If a technology haven't proven itself yet and it's not a viable alternative to other established proven methods, there won't be much investments coming in. Alpha Zero was such a milestone. Did they make money with it? Hell nah. It's just high risk. I might spend all my life without getting anywhere, but you know, I wouldn't come in without a little bit of confidence that I can turn things around. I'm still taking less risk than Schmidt Huber, who in late 80s wrote a thesis that he wants to build a machine smarter than him and then retire. <laughs> This guy. That was extremely risky. Now we have at least much more compute and progress done. We didn't see a lot of good news so far, so maybe let's look at the industry. 
Yeah. OpenAI was leading reinforcement learning development like around seven years ago. I mean, they put crucial work at developing Jim library, which is a standard even today. They made OpenAI 5, which was their AI that played Dora 2. They also had their Rubik's Cube project involving robotics, which was quite impressive. But now, they mostly like abandoned reinforcement learning. Not really, like, it's not that they don't believe in it. They just moved on to uh, build commercial products in other areas, and they disbanded their robotics team. After advancing the state of the art in reinforcement learning through our Rubik's Cube project and other initiatives, last October we decided not to pursue further robotics research and instead we focused the team on other projects. Because of the rapid progress in AI and its capabilities, we found that other approaches such as reinforcement learning with human feedback lead to faster progress in our reinforcement learning research. Now we know that they moved on to their generative models like ChatGPT and Sora and all the voice stuff. Uh, so they don't use a lot of RL, they only use RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback. And oh my goodness, I mean, Ascarpati, our legend, tweeted, RLHF is barely RL. Reinforcement learning with human feedback is the third and last major stage of training a large language model after pre-training and supervised fine-tuning. My rant on RLHF is that it's just barely RL, in a way that I think is not widely appreciated. RL is powerful, RLHF is not. So his point is that RLHF is only as good as human experts. But exactly what makes RL powerful is that it comes, like the agents come up with their own experiments, their own knowledge, they discover their own patterns and they exceed human knowledge, human capabilities. That's the whole power of RL. Like if you look at Alpha Zero play chess, for example, I mean, it's not that good anymore because they discontinued the project, but back in the day, if you look at their moves, how it played, it was amazing. Like you, you look at the play, you're like, well, what is even going on? What is this move? And it's a winning move. It's just like, it's beyond our knowledge. And this is what's beautiful in, an, uh, in RL. And this is not what's beautiful in RLHF. <laughs> also, RLHF doesn't scale and everything. I'm not even... I mean, oh, don't even get me started because I'm off. In another article we read, OpenAI's move away from robotics might be a reflection of the economic realities the company faces. DeepMind, the Alphabet-owned AI research lab, has undergone a similar shift in recent years as research and development costs mount, moving away from prestige projects in favor of work with commercial applications like protein shape prediction. I even found a nice DeepMind's profit graph, and they're profitable now even, but their main client is their parent company, so... A person in the AI industry with knowledge of DeepMind told CNBC that the revenue jump could be down to creative accounting. DeepMind declined to comment on the claim. I don't think DeepMind have many or any revenue streams, the CNBC source said, asking to remain anonymous due to the nature of the discussion. So all that income is based on how much Alphabet pays for internal services and that can be entirely arbitrary. I mean, I don't know, I'm just reading articles, I don't want to suggest anything. What we know for sure is that it's hard to make money currently with the reinforcement learning. Let's pause for a second. So these companies might be profitable in the future, but it will not be thanks to reinforcement learning, not in the near future, it will be thanks to generative AI. And on it goes, and that's how it always is with future technologies. I worked with virtual reality for a year, and there's no doubt that this is the future. Like, it's fantastic, did you try it? You can have, you can watch movies with arbitrarily large screens, like it's a cinema. At your home, you can just do anything. So why people don't use it? Because it sucks, I mean, the idea is fantastic. Everything's fantastic, except the execution. The execution is a ton of work. The same is for reinforcement learning. It's the future, but it's really, Hard. Now we know the most important things. And knowing all this, why would anyone study reinforcement learning? To do what nobody has ever done before. To beat all games. If you're insane slash have mental problems, just go for it, honestly. I mean, who knows? If you have family and kids um, and a lot to lose, probably not recommended 
But if you decide to commit to it, you're my brother in arms. And you better fasten your seatbelt because that's gonna be a ride and a half if I've ever seen one. For now, thanks for watching.